Well, I think we have a good majority of people who are here, so if we're ready to get started, Trisha, ready? Yep. All right. In that case, I will start introductions. Um, so welcome everyone to Trisha Pritkin's virtual event and virtual book launch. Uh, I'm glad you're all here to support authors and local readers and, of course, Grassroots as well. Uh, I'm Ashley, the Social Media and Events Coordinator here at Grassroots, and tonight we have author Trisha Pritkin and her guest Tom Bailey, Karen Dornsteel, and potentially, eventually, uh, Bob McCormick, all of whom will engage in a conversation with Trisha. Um, so I think some introductions are in order. Trisha Pritkin has worked for over 30 years for justice for those who, like her family, now face radiogenic cancer and other serious illness following exposure to ionizing radiation downwind of Manhattan Project and Cold War nuclear weapons production and testing sites. She is an attorney and former occupational therapist. Joining in her in conversation is Tom Bailey, who was born and raised in the farmlands across the Columbia River from Hanford. In the mid-1980s, oh, Bob Cormick is here. Yay! <laughs> in the mid-1980s, Tom alerted investigative reporter Karen Dorn Seal to cancers in his neighbors and heart attacks among young men working in the fields, resulting in Steele's stories on the Hanford Downwinders in the Spokesman Review. Karen Dorn Steele had a long career, has a long career as an environmental and investigative reporter and she unmasked nuclear secrecy and won a series of major national reporting awards for the Spokesman Review, the Daily Newspaper in Spokane, Washington. Here we also have, just recently, Bob McCormick, <laughs> whose mother, Charlotte Ray McCormick, grew up downriver and downwind of Hanford in Boardman, Oregon, along the Columbia River. Charlotte suffered from both leukemia and lymphoma prior to her death, and significant numbers of Bob's family have suffered serious health issues believed related to exposure to Hanford's airborne and riverborne radiation releases. So the way that this will work is Trisha, Tom, Bob, and Karen will engage in a conversation about Trisha's book, and then we'll open up the floor to a Q&A from audience members for the last 10 or so minutes or however much time we have left. Uh, feel free to write your questions during the presentation or after. Uh, in the chat box, and I will call on you to read them out at the end. Um, and of course, feel free to add messages of any kind to the chat box. Uh, I also want to note that I will shortly be posting the link to buy the Hanford Plaintiffs in the chat. I highly encourage you to buy Trisha's book um, from us. Not only will you be supporting Trisha as an author, but also Grassroots as a small local bookstore that's able to bring events like this to you. So all that being said, Trisha, take it away. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, first, before I start, I wanna acknowledge a few people who are here who have done so much for Han on Hanford over the years, who are here, uh, who I can see. Um, we've got, in addition, here's Linda Richards up in the right, my right corner, who's just an amazing advocate for people like me. Some of you, you I don't know and I bet you've done just as much as the people I'm going to introduce so I apologize for those of you I don't know that I can't introduce. Bo Jacobs who's an amazing international advocate for people exposed to low-dose ionizing radiation. Uh, James I don't know you and Bud I don't know you yet. Uh, Shannon Cram who's one of my favorite people, uh, PhD in geography working on some Hanford issues. Jim Thomas who's one of the original researchers who piled through a whole heap of papers that were declassified by the DOE in 1986 and did a lot of research for the litigation. He's just a wealth of knowledge. Theodora, who served with me on the archives, uh, Hanford Archives, she's down here. Uh, Bob McCormick, who you'll hear from very soon. Sarah Fox, who's one of my heroes, who does all sorts of things for people with, who've been exposed to Nevada test site, Hanford, et cetera. And Kim Hoagland, who actually acquired this book when she was over at uh, University Press of Kansas. And so if it wasn't for her, you're in trouble. Uh, let's see. And Yuki, who is a buddy of mine, and she's also a uh, second generation Hiroshima survivor. She's down here in my square down here. And thank you for being there. And she just put up a clap emoji. Um, some of the other folks I don't know, Anne Labar, you're going to hear about uh, very soon. She's collecting oral histories of Hanford Downwinders at Eastern Washington University. 
And the three in the bottom, I don't know. So sorry for anybody I didn't introduce. I don't know everyone, but I just wanted to make sure to shout out for the people who've done so much. Okay, um, for, for those who don't know much about Hanford, I just wanted to say a few words because not everybody knows about Hanford and what it did or what its purpose was. Well, first of all, this was going to be an in-person uh, book launch back in spring until the pandemic hit. And now thanks to Ashley and everyone at Grassroots, we were able to do this virtually and I'm very thankful for that. Um, and I wanna thank you for your introductions as well, Ashley, very much. Uh, I also wanted to thank Karen Dorn Steele, Bob McCormick and Tom Bailey, who are all here who are amazing advocates for the downwinders and I'm so thankful they are participating tonight and you'll hear from each of them. The Hanford plaintiff actually introduces the stories of 24 uh, plaintiffs in the personal injury litigation known as Henry Hanford Nuclear Reservation litigation, which is now concluded. And these were all people who lived within the vast downwind radioactive zone that Hanford produced, either air, from airborne radiation or from pollution dumped straight into the Columbia River. Karen Doran Steele wrote the introduction for this book, and I'm really honored by that because without Karen, I don't think there would be a story. And she's really one of my heroes, and her, her introduction is excellent. And I'm, I'm just really honored that she decided to do that. The um, foreword was co-authored by two of the attorneys who represented Hanford Downwinders, Tom Folds of Seattle, and Richard Iman of Spokane. So Hanford is a federal nuclear weapons production facility that produced the majority of the plutonium for the US nuclear weapons uh, program. It produced the plutonium for the very first, world's first test of an atomic weapon, that's the Trinity test, deton detonated July 16th, 1945, and produced the plutonium for Fat Man that was dropped on Nagasaki August 9th, 1945. <clears throat> it's located in southeastern, south central Washington state along the Columbia River. And that's important because due to the fact it was on the river, you also had a lot of down river communities that were impacted in addition to those who were impacted by airborne radiation. Um, so beginning with startup of the facility in late 1944, Radioactive byproducts were secretly released from the facility to the air through Eastern Washington, Northern Oregon, Idaho, Western Montana, and entering into uh, BC. Um, and it continued for more than 40 years during the Cold War uh, without letting the public know that any of this was happening. And the, f the public in fact didn't learn of these releases till 1986 when the Department of Energy responding to Freedom of Information Act requests and increasing public pressure and Karen's reporting, I'm convinced, finally declassified thousands of early operating records revealing Hanford's uh, radioactive legacy. Now we're gonna focus on Tom up here. He's up in my top row. I don't know where he is on your screen, but in the mid 1980s, Tom Bailey, who's a, who was a farmer in a small town across the Columbia from the Hanford facility, contacted Karen Doran Steele of Spokane Spokesman Review to let her know about cancers he was seeing in his neighbors and about numerous deaths from heart attacks in young men who worked the fields. Bailey suspected that an undisclosed radioactive or other toxic release from Hanford might have had something to do with these health issues. Steele had to work pretty hard to convince her editors at the Spokesman Review that there was something to the stories Bailey and his neighbors shared with her. I'm going to now turn things over to Karen to describe how she first became interested in the stories of cancers and other illness amongst the farm families downwind of Hanford. Tom's role in alerting Karen that something was very wrong downwind of Hanford was key to her reporting and without Karen's reporting the public would not have ultimately been made aware that Hanford had released undisclosed radiation downwind. Okay, Karen, take it away. Okay, thanks, Tricia. Yeah, there's a bit of a lead up here. I was hired by the Spokesman Review in 1982. I'd worked in Congress and um, for 10 years with public television in Spokane, where I had my own television weekly news show, but I was recruited away from the paper. And I got interested in Hanford almost immediately. I mean, you have to remember the early 
1980s, Ronald Reagan has become president. He's announced a, a, a major nuclear arms buildup to counter the Soviet Union. And he's reopened an old plant, a mothballed 1956 factory at Hanford called Purex, which sounds like a bleach plant, but it's actually an acronym for plutonium uranium extraction. And I got a call from a woman working in that plant in 1984 who said, we're gonna blow up Pasco one of these days. And that got my attention, you know, this was two years before the tragic Chernobyl accident. And uh, so I went to see her at night, you know, this was before cell phones, so nobody could track me. I met her in a motel and she told me, she gave me a kind of a roadmap to uh, report this story, which I did using the Freedom of Information Act. And it turned out that Purex indeed was missing plutonium, either missing it through theft or missing it through um, buildups in the um, in the nooks and crannies of the plants, which would have been even more serious because it could have caused an explosion. Uh, so we did that story. Uh, there was a lot of pushback. The FBI visited my editors in the newsroom. Uh, we were accused when the story was published from um, interest in, Han and in the Tri-Cities where Hanford is located that we were unpatriotic. I got threatening phone calls. All kinds of things happened. But in a way that got my newspaper out in the in the region as a force that was covering this story. So I began to get more and more uh, people calling me about concerns um, about Hanford, including Tom Bailey, who I actually met at a cocktail party for our congressman, uh, Tom Foley, who later became the uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. He was our Spokane's Nancy Pelosi, basically. But we met at a cocktail party and Tom was kind of joking around a little and I asked him about Hanford and uh, was it, whether he was worried about Hanford. And he said, well, they only kill a few sheep. Uh, well, they only kill a few of our sheep now and then. And I was intrigued by that because I knew a little bit about what had happened down in Nevada, you know, with the, with the nuclear explosions and, and the sheep, massive sheep deaths down there. And it sort of, I sort of, I, my interest was piqued. And as Tricia said, it, it took some convincing of my edit from my editors, of my editors, to let me go down there and pursue this story. But uh, Tom was my host and he introduced me to many of his neighbors and it turned out to be fascinating. These are farmers, mostly living right across the river from Hanford, and uh, who had for decades been concerned about the levels of illness in their community. They, uh, one couple, the Andrew Jeskies, were keeping death maps, which Tricia also writes about in her book. Um, and then they, ex they also explained to me in great details about um, about releases in the early 60s that led to these uh, terrible sheep deaths in which hundreds of sheep and uh, young uh, ewes in the area um, where uh, had, had baby lambs that were born mummified and, and, and gruesomely uh, deformed. Uh, so I wrote that story and there was a huge impact from that story because um, this was the first community around Hanford that had ever talked about the possibility of, um, of damage from Hanford. And so we went on to uh, join others of the Hanford Education um, Action League in Spokane, which Jim Thomas was a member, was also doing good work on this subject. Um, the Seattle and Oregon, uh, the Oregonian and Portland also did some good stories. But collectively, we worked on this story. And my newspaper was one of the entities that filed large Freedom of Information Act request to the Department of Energy to find out what the true story was. Because when we asked, was there any proof that Tom Bailey's neighbors could have been harmed? They said, well, those documents, at least most of them were still classified, not available to the public. And this was, you know, 1986, a long, long time after the end of World War II. And so we pursued that and the release of the documents, as Tricia mentioned, was very dramatic. And it, and it ultimately led to stories that showed that Hanford had massive uh, contamination, the largest from any nuclear weapons facility in the country, and also led us, uh, I broke the story that, that came out of those documents on the Green Run, which was a deliberate secret 1949 military experiment in which a plant at Hanford was allowed to run or was ordered by the military to run without its, its, um, its safety filters spreading um, radioactive iodine all over the region from the Dalles, Oregon, way through Eastern Washington into all, all the way to Spokane and even to Western Montana. And so that narrative of Hanford being safe and um, that nobody had to be concerned was completely shattered by um, the release of these documents. That was um, in March of 1986. And of course, 
three months later, uh, the Chernobyl reactor blew in the U Ukraine. And so this story of the safety of plutonium facilities became a worldwide story as well as a major national story. So I guess I'll leave it there for now and we can go on to, if you want to talk about the downwinders trial later, we can do that. Okay, great. Thanks, Karen, very much. Um, next, I'm going to focus on Tom because Tom was so crucial and still is to this story. And it was Tom's work with Karen that really started, you know, Karen being aware that something was going on out there across, at least in the farmlands across from Hanford. So Tom, I have a couple questions for you. And if you want to, Karen, if you have questions you want to ask to Tom as well, you know, we could do that. So Tom, first of all, I wanted to have you tell us about uh, you as a child. Were you a healthy kid? Did you have any health problems? Well, my mother lost a baby before me that was deformed. I was born in 1947, and my skeleton was so crooked they didn't diagnose it with rickets. I had other birth defects. And uh, I went into paralysis in 1951 and went into an iron lung. Then I, growing up as a grade schooler, I can remember my hair falling out two different times. The milk we drank tasted like metal. It had a metal taste to it. And uh, yes. well, uh, my health was just horrible asthma. I was re recalling this morning that I used to go into the school of Pasco, Washington. Once a week, I go to the doctor's office, and he'd, he'd open up sebaceous cysts that were growing all over my body. Huh. I was infected. Wow. And then I had surgeries to correct the birth defects. Then I found out I was sterile at age 18. So my, my health, my childhood was miserable. You what? touch your nose, you start a bloody nose. Say that again? Bloody nose. We had bloody noses a lot in school. Right. I've heard. I've, I've heard a lot of people say that they kids had had bloody noses in the area downwind. Tell. Can you tell us a little bit about your neighborhood and how you had reported to Karen that there were many people who had cancers out there or birth defects? Well, if you run a, run a test on what radiation does to people, it's a perfect community. In 1955, I was the only child in the school except for the gas station attendant's son. In 1956, the government let veterans of World War II and Korea draw farm units, 80 acres apiece, but they had to live on the farm and they had to have a family. And they had to keep track of their diet. And they moved in. By the eighth grade, there was 85 of us kids graduated out of that class at Eltopia. Now these people are not genetically related at all. They were barbers, hairdressers, they weren't farmers at all. We farmed, that's all we ever did. But these people that came in were veterans. Some smoked, some were alcoholics, some were But in every block, there was about 120 farm units split up in every block. And every one of them got a number. A farm unit 38, block 14, and that family was on there. And they got a loan from the federal government to farm it with. They were horrible farmers, but they, they wanted to prove up and make, uh, make something out of themselves. So if you want to study indiscriminate genetic damage, there it is. They put Mormons, they put Mormons in uh, blocks, two or three Mormon families in each, each block. That was your control group. No smoking, no drinking. Yeah. And uh, Karen and I found out that around the, the death mile, there was... Uh, 27 families, 25 of them had health effects of birth defects, cancers, or thyroid problems. Now today it's 100% of them. They're all gone. Most of those families are gone now. They just kind of faded away and Mexicans live in their houses. Okay. What else? Well, tell me a bit, please, about what you remember of Men in white suits with Geiger counters coming out to your farm when you were little and collecting things. Well, you want to hear about the unusual occurrences? Well, I grew up with unusual occurrences. They weren't unusual to me. 
Uh, one of my first recollections of seeing men walking across the stubble field or the summer fall field with soldiers behind them. And they were in any contamination suits and they were sweeping the ground with like a mine detector in front of them. And you know what? I could never figure out where those soldiers came from, how they got there, because they came from the, west, from the west side. There was nobody out there beyond our house. No one lived out there. But I didn't know at that time that the Nike Missile Battalion was stationed out there. That's why the soldiers were, would show up once in a while. Dr. Norwood from Hanford would come and he gave me a He'd pick up duck, duck's head, geese head, dead chickens, dead pigs, anything you find that was dead around the farm. They'd come and pick it up. They sampled our milk once a week in the 50s and 60s. Each one of those blocks of land had small dairies in them. What did and, they tell you? Uh, did you ask them why they were doing this testing and collecting? Yeah, of course. The reply was, we're checking the air and we'll tell you if there's anything wrong. You're really lucky to live here, Tom, because you had nothing but tested air to breathe. Highly tested and safe. <laughs> it's been Highly interesting. Because, <laughs> it's so interesting because I know, Tom, you went through, when after my story came out, you went through a lot of, of hell from both Tri-Cities people and some other people in your neighborhood. But four years later, when the government finally admitted that they had caused harm to downwinders, including your, your, um, your farming community, they also said that your particular area directly across the Columbia River from Hanford was a place where people were most likely to have been exposed to the largest doses of thyroid-seeking radioactive iodine. So basically, you were right all, all along. But Maybe you could talk about some of the reactions after my story came out, both from your community and in the Tri-Cities. Christ, the community went crazy, it went berserk. They tried to pay me as a communist. The bank cut off my credit line. My parents were pissed off. My mother, you know, she worked for the Manhattan Project. She was a typist for Robert Oppenheimer. She was pissed off. Everybody was pissed off. We had death threats just like Karen. I got phone calls in the middle of the night. You better shut up. The Hanford FBI is watching you. You're a focus of attention. Yeah, it was pretty rough. Yeah. Somebody always wanted to start a fight with me. And you've dealt with that for so many years. Just the fact that you spoke up puts you in the spotlight in such a difficult way. I mean, really, I, I thank you for yes. that. And I admire you for your strength in dealing with that. Well, Karen made our mark. <laughs> yeah, but it, had, it took both well, you Karen. and Karen to do this, you know, really. Well, so, that's true. Yeah, it took the combination of you and Karen. Um, what do you want people to, to know? And this is a big question, but what do you want people to understand about Hanford and what has happened to the downwinders? I know that's a really big question, but... Um, just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, we got, we, we got the truth out of them, but they got off the hook for com compensation for damages. Yeah. Damn legal system. You'll talk about that, but that, that's just a joke. But yeah. we got the truth. Finally. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, so... I want now to move to Bob McCormick, and Bob's story is a story of exposure along the Columbia River within Portland, within Oregon. And that's why, you know, I, I love that he's participating with an Oregon bookshop because he is an Oregon Hanford Downlander, both from airborne exposures and from riverborne exposures. And there was a lot of radio, radioactive stuff dumped into the river, a lot, that we don't know about, that, that there wasn't a dose reconstruction done for. We basically only know about a couple of the radionuclides that were airborne. So, um, one, I, I would like to, uh, the very first story in the Hanford Plaintiffs is the story of Bob McCormick's mom, Charlotte Ray McCormick, who grew up in 
what was the earlier Boardman, which was right along the Columbia River, right, Bob? And then it moved out back from the riverbank. That's right, okay. And the boat, the family made use of a boat. They had a boat, they did a lot of water skiing, they swam in the Columbia. And they used to put it in the okay, and so um, Char Bob is gonna tell us a little bit about his family's story, um, starting with a bit about his mom's life in Boardman, if you don't mind. Okay. okay. Hi, everybody, and thank you for letting me be a part of this. It uh, means a lot to me and my family, and I'm very nervous. Um, uh, my mother was very special, and as you'll hear, um, a big influence and big part of each of our lives. And um, her family, her parents moved from um, Idaho to Boardman area when she was about um, five years old, six years old, which would have been about 1943 uh, or four. And her parents had a little farm there and uh, my grandma and a friend of hers, her sister and um, owned a little store. Um, they farmed there. My mom went to school. There's a picture of her on her uh, Boardman school parade bike in the book. And um, the river was a big part of um, life there. It was the, obviously a source for water and the farming, you know, people got raised their own food um, and swimming was a big deal and fishing. Um, then in uh, night, uh, my mom graduated high school. We, they moved, I'd been born in 1963. I lived there about, four or five years. I remember to this day swimming in the Columbia. I don't know if any of you have ever swam in the Columbia, even in Portland, at Sol uh, I think it's Salby's Island. The river is very warm in places. And I always remembered that. Um, it's probably the only, anyway. Um, so uh, we moved to Portland and then in 1988, my dad was a carpenter and my mom um, was a secretary and worked and then they got divorced and my mom ended up raising the four of us mainly and um, three older girls and then me. And then, um, and I think it was 1988, my mom got lymphoma. I get them mixed up. There's so many in our family. I get them mixed up that she got a lymph, oh no, uh, leukemia. That's what it was. AML. Is that what it's called, Tricia? AML? I'm amyelotropic. Uh, uh, so, right? Well, I think, well, she had both leukemia and lymphoma, and I can't recall without looking at the book which yeah. one was first. Yeah. Well, it was leukemia first. Her brothers came from Eastern Oregon, did platelet donations three times a week. Um, then she um, ended up uh, being in remission for a few years. Then she. Um, her husband, my stepdad, died um, it, uh, in um, June of um, 93. My mom ended up getting lymphoma, and uh, she ended up passing away in December of 93. Well, after that, um, uh, I was watching the news one day on KOIN, and I saw a story about Hanford. And um, so I started, I called them and they ended up doing a new story. And that's how I found out about litigation and exposure and um, how I didn't find out all what happened. But so my mom became a plaintiff or I mean a, uh, yeah. Yeah. a plaintiff, yeah. Yeah. one of the thousands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then after she died, um, my oldest sister developed different types of cancer in her um, reproductive organs, in her bowels. She has a colostomy bag. My second sister down had um, a hysterectomy. My third sister, the third eldest, has um, um, uh, fibromyalgia. I have heart problems. I have diabetes. I have breathing problems. And uh, I was, we were all healthy up until we turned around 40. I was strong as an ox until like 40. 
And sitting here listening to Tom, Tom. or no, yeah, Tom, and um, hear about Brett. people saying you're not a patriot. That's fresh. That's pretty. Uh, I'll get to that, Tricia, later, I guess. Yeah, you see the military yourself there, Bob, right? You're, I mean. I have a picture of a Ronald Reagan calendar mm -hmm. in base because I was in the military, in the Navy from 81 to 90. Ronald Reagan was my hero. Um, and as you'll find out, whoever reads this book, what happened during that presidency about what's called the Warner Amendment or Warner, whatever it's called, mm -hmm. made me really angry yeah. and a lot are gone who don't have a voice yeah. so you've had a lot of deaths and a lot of cancers within your family and i mean really more than most families have when you look at the whole picture you guys have really gone through a lot I just, uh, every time i hear your story i just my second sister down's daughter um, she had leukemia, the same exact kind as my mom's, mm. um, which at 29, she was 29, my, uh, my niece, and she just told me yesterday that that is so rare. Her oncologist had never seen um, a person where a grandmother had one type, had the AML type, and then a, a, a generation or two down got the exact same one. Mm. I don't know, um, but... Um, she and then she was in remission for a while, and now she has what's called nephropathy, which attacks kidneys. And she's 40, 39 to 40 years old, and um, it's just uh, all of a sudden you think things are going great, and then a little your health starts going. And, um, no one wants to be accountable, and then they make fun of you and call you and say you're not a patriot. I have an American flag on my front door. I am a patriot. Yeah, exactly. A lot of the people who are exposed are very patriotic people. I mean, very. Just yeah. And, you know, I was I was listening to an interview with uh, Tom Folds and Dick Iman on the Atomic Heritage Foundation website, and they talked about a not well known study of people exposed to the river pathway where a, a, a researcher, I don't know who he was, did a, did, did a study on certain cancers, not thyroid cancer, but other cancers, and found a high incidence of quite a number of cancers for people who used the river water during the years of plutonium production for irrigation, drinking, etc. So it just hasn't been followed up on. You know, I thought that was fascinating because both Tom Folds and Dick Iman mentioned it in those interviews. Yeah. Uh, Bob, what do you, a big, big question again, like I asked Tom, what do you want people to understand about Hanford and what has happened to the downwinders? What, what do you want to, people to take away well, from this? I want people, uh, first of all, to um, value and cherish each moment you have with your family members because you never know what's going to happen. And um, I think to try to be aware of what's going on around you and um, um, I mean, I can get really angry. I'm really angry that the fact that what happened was, was that the government hired someone to do this and then they end up doing it wrong. And then the government says later on, well, they're not responsible and then the people are just going to have to suffer. So I guess getting involved, it, when you look at someone you love, if you tonight look at someone you love in the face, and when you look at that person, imagine that's how Bob feels about his mom or how Tom feels about his family or how every one of them feels about them. And they were all of a sudden taken out of mismanagement, poor uh managing of the um something very seriously hazardous yeah yeah there was a lack of oversight and public input 
during the whole period of nuclear weapons production and testing in this country. And here we are back dealing with government oversight of a brand new crisis now. I mean, a lot of people have pointed out to me that it feels like history's repeating itself in some ways. I think what you just said was very important about the government because as the trial of the, for the downwinders played out, it took 25 years, but what he said is very, very important because the contractors who operated Hanford for the government are big companies, General Electric, DuPont, they were indemnified by our government, which meant they would, they would have no legal liability for any harm that they caused. But not only would they be a, a, a indemnified in individual trials, but the money, the, but the government was obligated to pay all of their legal defenses. And the trial that Trisha and, and the other plaintiffs went through for 25 years from 1990 to the 2015 settlement meant that the the defendant contractors at Hanford had carte blanche to spend as money as much money as what their lawyers thought was necessary, uh, and that is a very unusual situation in a trial. In most yeah. trials, you have plaintiffs and defendants, and after a while, people run out of money and they have to settle. But yeah. in this case, the U.S. Treasury continued to uh, they, at least a hundred million dollars was spent defending the um, the government contractors against the plaintiffs like Trisha and Bob and, uh, and Bob's and mother and other people. So yeah, that's something systemically that we really have to look at as a country. It is. Could I, um, I, I think that's, that's amazing. I hate to interrupt, but no. I just wanted to mention one thing that another thing that I think is a big deal and it's uh, something in Trisha's book that she wrote here on page 190. Um, it talks about the Warner Amendment and she talks about how it was slipped in in, in a, a Ryder Amendment. It wasn't even, didn't even go in front of the Senate Judiciary Committees for oversight or, uh, or, or whatever. And it says here that the Warner Amendment was applied retroactively resulting in the removal to federal court of the personal injury tort actions previously filed in state court against the contractors by downwinders. So what, what I just realized is that the federal government took it out of the state's hands yeah. in order to prevent what prevent liability of it took the, away a lot of the nevada test site downwinders rights there are a lot of state court state suits already filed when that happened and yeah. by doing that they made it to where the companies were not held accountable and so um why do you think people are so apt to follow along and so don't say anything because you're, you're unpatriotic you'll look this way or that way why not you know like the person wrote in this book uh, one of the stories he he thought the government would act concerned and cared yeah. about their family but yeah exactly it's a surprise to a lot of americans that their government many times doesn't care at all about their welfare and i think the downwinders have learned that firsthand and it's hard not to be really negative i hate the fourth of july i won't watch fireworks anymore i mean you know i'm not terribly awful but i really i'm not patriotic like that anymore so yeah but um as to the litigation there were the nevada test site downwinders sued under the federal tort claims act after the warner amendment was passed all these uh suits were in federal court and they had a great judge judge jenkins um and he actually found for a number of the nevada test site uh personal injury plaintiffs but it, the uh the uh, case was overturned by the Tenth Circuit based on the uh, discretionary function exception of the Federal Tort Claims Act. The Hanford litigation was filed under Price Anderson. It's a different uh, basis for the suits. But the point I want to make is that of all these thousands of plaintiffs, many of whom had more than one uh, cancer or other illness, only the one, a few got any kind of settlement. And the settlement was very, very low. In fact, um, I know, you know, I was talking to Bob about that. Here he had a, his mom die of a cancer that has been shown in workers to be related to radiation exposure, yet their settlement was very, very low. I won't say how much because we're not supposed to, but 
ridiculously low amount, embarrassingly low. And so it's a tough situation. And when you compare us to the Nevada test site downwinders, some of whom are eligible for Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, not all of them, but some of them, the amount that the Nevada, the Hanford downwinders received, those of us who did, was like a fifth of what they received for under RECA, and RECA's compensation is very, very low. So the whole system nationally needs to be seen as one big picture, I think. There needs to be a national compensation program, and any cancer or other illness that's recognized as radiation exposed in nuclear workers should be recognized in downwinders as radiation caused, and they should give us the benefit of the doubt like they do the workers. So we don't have to have a dose reconstruction and say, look, if you have any of these diseases that are considered radiation caused, you get compensation if you live within an exposure area during, during certain years. That's what I think makes a bit of sense. But anyway, that's me on my rampage here. <laughs> Tricia, your own, your own family is a perfect exemplar of that with your father as a nuclear worker, but you <laughs> as a civilian child, it and is. yet there was a, ultimately a, a compensation program set up for Hanford nuclear workers, right. but not for their family members or for Tom Bailey's neighborhood or anybody. Right. My family is fascinating because they were nuclear workers. My dad died of thyroid cancer. I had cancerous thyroid cancer cells found in a nodule. My dad was able to get compensation because he's a nuclear worker, but my thyroid cancer was, you know, not even considered because I'm a civilian. Yet I was a child without any choice in the matter when I was exposed, and I was much more sensitive than an adult. So that there's no logic there in that whole thing. So anyway, <laughs> um, I could go into some of the health problems I've had, but I want to make sure we have time for questions. And it's like, so I'll leave it to Ashley to decide what you'd rather do with the remaining time. All right. Um, well, thank you for such an interesting conversation, all of you, first of all. Um, I saw that earlier in the, the evening, Abigail had a couple of really interesting questions. Um, Abigail, if you want to unmute yourself or, or let your video go on, otherwise I'm happy to ask them. I think you could probably direct it better than I can. Hi. Um, I don't know how to turn the video back on, but <laughs> uh, do you want me to read the questions I wrote? Oh, yeah, go for it. And so what, also you'd like to answer them as well. What exposure would people have had living in Portland, Salem, and Corvallis in the 1960s to present? And has anyone tested soil, water, and air in the Willamette Valley then and now? Ooh. That's not something I have the expertise to answer. Is there anyone else here who has that expertise? Just all the documents, all the documents that I've seen um, that pertain to radiation exposure in Oregon, but it's in eastern Oregon, you know, from the Dalles east. Mm -hmm. And um, I, it was rare, rare that the wind blew in a westerly direction towards Portland. I think Portland, Salem, and Corvallis did get fallout from the um, Nevada test site in some of oh. the, the bomb um, uh, the, in the 50s, but I, I'm not aware of, of exposures, airborne exposures at least, in, in Portland, uh, Salem, and Corvallis. Yeah, um, some people in, in Portland, depending on where they got their water from, uh, would have had some Columbia River exposure, yeah. mainly in the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s. <clears throat> um, Salem and Corvallis, uh, probably not very much in the way of air releases from Hanford because that's just not the way the wind typically blows. But certainly from the U.S. testing uh, in the Pacific, uh, as well as uh, tests from both China and from uh, the Soviet Union, uh, their testing program, that fallout would have uh, rained out uh, a lot in Portland, Salem, and Corvallis. We're all down. Yeah. yeah. One of, the, one of my favorite stories I found in the documents talks about Hanford employees going to the Oregon coast for vacation, coming back home and setting off the alarm bells when they walked through the door. They had eaten the Willapaw Bay oysters. <laughs> now, if that contamination went out to the Willapaw Bay, it was damn sure in the Columbia River. Yeah. 
I also see an interesting question from Anne Labar. There are a couple of questions, Anne, if you want to ask those. Sure, hello. Um, just a second. Okay, I don't have my video on, but um, I, Tom Bailey, I wanted to ask you a question because you described how negatively your neighbors responded when you, when the first stories came out in the spokesman review, how do they, do they speak with you about this now? Has their attitude changed about the exposure and um, the cover up and all that? They don't think there's a cover up. Most of them are gone. They don't, I'm, well, I'm the only one that's left almost down here. They're either mm -hmm. dead or been sold out. They've been flushed down the toilet, most of them, those veterans how, and their family. How about, like, the, I don't know if you have any connection to the Tri-Cities community now, like the people in Richland or the people in, in, in you know, Pasco. D is there any local awareness that, you're, that you know of, of about the impact of, the, of Hanford and of... The radiation exposure? Yes, but they don't like to talk about it because it's economically driven. It's money. Right. Don't talk about the crops being contaminated. Don't talk about the river water being contaminated. We drink that river water. It can't be contaminated. We eat those vegetables. They can't pick up proscenium and burn the inside of the intestines. Yeah. They just are in denial, denial, denial. If you look in the Tri Cities today, there's half a million and a million dollar houses being built all over the tops of those hills. We've got the largest input of people that I've ever seen. We're the fastest growing community in the United States of America right now. You can't find a lot to build a house on. The big bucks in that muck and truck. Definitely. Yeah. So to answer your question, occasionally somebody with a scar around their neck will come up and say, aren't you Tom Bailey? I go, yeah. I want to thank you for what you did. Yeah. Occasionally it happens. Wow. But remember, remember this, when, when I'm speaking, I'm speaking on behalf of the dead, the dying, and the unborn. That's not a very strong audience. No, no, it's not. Can't, can't stand up to the military industrial complex with that. No, you can't. Low use segment of the population, they call this. What's that? What was that last bit? They call this a low use segment of the population. <laughs> yeah, the truth tellers. Right, Karen? That's right, and that's right in the documents. Yeah. Did they really call them that? Oh yeah. my goodness. Yeah. I, th I thought that's you were you, joking. Bob. No, I wasn't joking. I guess I'll have to change <laughs> now. <laughs> hey, I'm part of something. No. Yeah, that's us. Low use segment. That's us. Uh, if I could ask another question, um, and uh, there are a bunch of others, um, but you know, because the documents from the Hanford Health Information Network are here in the um, Greater Spokane area now, they're actually in the Washington State Archives. Um, occasionally, I'm now getting emails from downwinders or people who think they may have been exposed about how they might access medical care and that in turn raises a question is anybody are there any medical studies ongoing about the health impacts of radiation exposure and it's, i mean specifically the specifically the downwinders the way that that was intense exposure but that people didn't really know about until they were you know in their 40s or 50s does anybody know of any health experts working on this now? Well, I'd like to respond to that point because it's very important. Yeah. I think there is an intentional lack of study of this group. This is an available group. Uh, many of us have been willing to be studied. Yeah. It, it's a trackable group. We, we saw that because the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry was able to track a bunch of us and find us. And also the Hanford Thyroid Disease Study found a bunch of us. Right. But no study was done of anything other than thyroid cancer, thyroid disease, and I-131 related health mm -hmm. issues. And I think that was intentional. And to the best of my knowledge, 
you know, following up on that, there are no such studies underway, particularly of hamper downwinders. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Karen? you continue, you tried to get, uh, you, you challenged the end of the ATSDR studies in court unsuccessfully. Yep. Um, unsuccessfully, that's right. There was supposed to be an exposure sub-registry that went along with a medical monitoring program that was recommended by the ATSDR for those of us at highest risk. I was part of that group from childhood exposures. The, as I understand it, the exposure sub-registry would have kind of made note of other health issues we had along the way. So it would have provided a lot of useful information. But because the Department of Energy was in charge of deciding whether to fund that or not, you know, the, neither program was funded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it was extremely frustrating to those of us who worked for years in good faith with ATSDR. And I feel ATSDR's officials also worked in good faith towards having this happen. And then the Department of Energy just put up a blockade. Mm -hmm. Yep. I have a question, Tricia. Yeah. You mind if I ask a question? No, Bob, fine. Well, if you don't, Karen, I think the last time we did this, I think it was Karen put it in perspective about how much radiation we're talking about, like just part of, compared to Three Mile Island, or was it that one? Or no, not Three Mile, was it? I'm not yeah, sure, but. You're right, you're right. There's yeah. that. And then what about descendants or uh, of downwinders who, like my niece is two generations away, um, but she now has stuff. Big issue. You know, that's a huge issue. Uh, the next generation health effects. And um, I bet Yuki could speak to that too. I mean, she's a next generation uh, Hibakusha of Hiroshima. I mean, the same issues that they have to look at and worry about. A lot of, you're, you're a next generation downwinder, and there was also uh, one of the stories in the book is of Brenda Weaver's uh, girl, Jamie, who was born without eyes, without optic nerves. Um, you know, so there's a lot that needs to be studied, and I think it's, again, intentional that nothing, none of this is being studied. No money's been put into it. They don't want to know. They don't want us to know. So, yeah. <laughs> Question from I, oh, sorry, can I say something? Um, Trisha mentioned yeah. my name. Hi, you. Uh, thank you. Hi, uh, this is great. I'm learning a lot from people's questions and answers and stuff. Uh, but when it comes to the second generation, um, you know, the uh, oldest, the second generation is 75, uh, almost 76 years old because uh, someone was. Uh, who was in mother's womb was considered as the second generation as well. Um, so, but but still, and then now, uh, because of Fukushima, those second generation groups are trying to work with them and trying to um, work on, with the, appealing to the government that they should study more systematically. And it's been 75 years. And so it's now the third and fourth generation. And the Hiroshima was just not, not that downplaying, downplaying the um, um, magnitude, but it's one time thing. Whereas, you know, uh, low dose radiation uh, down windows are constantly exposed to. So I think it's, um, it's a serious issue. So I just wanted to chime in. Thanks. Thanks, Yuki. Thank you for that. Well, could I just say one thing, and that is what I was getting at about the exposure was, I think it was Three Mile Island or or Chernobyl is rated at a certain number for severity, like a 12 or whatever. And each one of those what is like a million, uh, whatever. And Hanford was not 12, but a million in the, the you know what I'm talking about yeah yeah I think right there was uh, about 750 to 800,000 curious of just radio iodine itself released from Hanford and they often compare it to Three Mile Island which is about 15 to 27 curies just to put it in perspective yeah
So we're running a little oh, short. Oh, go ahead, Tom. There's a quote by one of the professors at WSU that I like to say. Hanford's releases were the largest releases in the history of the free world. They were done deliberately, and then they made a secret out of it. Remember that, Karen? Yes, I do. Yeah, they turned out to be the largest from any Large. U.S. nuclear weapons plant. They weren't as large as, um, as uh, the Chernobyl explosion. And then there was an even larger uh, um, <laughs> catastrophe in, um, in Siberia in the Soviet Union at a place called Kushtum back in 1957. Uh, so the two Soviet catastrophes were worse than Hanford, but Hanford, in terms of its total releases, was the worst from any U.S. weapons production site. Mm. So if you want to put it in context, that's one way of doing yeah. it. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Oh, Ashley, I want to make sure that to, to mention one thing that we talked about a little bit ahead of time, and this involves Anne. Uh, Anne uh, is working on a program uh, now, a new one, to collect oral histories from people who were exposed downwind of Hanford from their families. And uh, Anne, could you talk just a bit about how people can get uh, in touch with you for that? Unmute, you're still muted. Okay. In spite of COVID, um, the Eastern Washington, or the Washington State um, Digital Archives and the Eastern Washington Branch, which is where all of the um, Hanford materials are now um, collected, we're still able to do oral histories, um, which would be added to the existing um, hundreds of oral histories of downwinders that are going to be accessible electronically they're actually starting to go online now and so we're making the, the the state archives is making a digital repository of the stories of downwinders and we can continue to collect these oral histories over the phone so if you or a family member of yours is interested in recording an oral history all you need to do, it's, it's a little bit complicated um, to set it up simply because there are legal documents that you have to waive certain rights or, you know, claim, you know, certain exemptions and so forth and so on. You have to establish your, sort of the status that you want your records to be preserved in. So there's some paperwork up front, but um, if you email me, you can, I can send you the paperwork you can look at it, fill it out, and then send it back to me in the good old fashioned snail mail. And, um, and then once I've got that paperwork back, I can set up uh, to have an oral <laughs> of you over the phone. So if anyone in, is interested in those oral histories, um, what you should do is just email me. Um, and yeah, the answer to the question, Shannon, yes, the downwinder, um, let's see, depositions that are currently, ooh, no, I don't know about the UW VHS tapes. I, that question from Shannon, I don't know the answer about whether they're going to be digitized. It's a different project that was probably a different collection, so I don't know. Not that I know of as yet. That's Ann Jenner. You could ask her at UW. Yeah. Um, also, what is your email, Anne? Okay. So to, if you are interested in submitting or, or having your oral history um, added to the collection, reach out to me at, and I'm going to put this in the chat. It's A-L-E-B-A-R at E-W-U dot E-D-U. So there you go. Great. Thanks. And as soon as you, as you reach out to me, I will mail you the paperwork. And then whenever you get the paperwork back to me, we can set up the oral history interview. Did that say ale bar? Ale bar. How about that? Ale bar. <laughs> it is ale bar. <laughs> My parents are planning ahead. I never thought of that. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> the only thing you're missing is a pub. <laughs> yeah. Right now, yes. Absolutely. I'm missing a pub. Yeah. Me too. Totally missing. Me too. Yeah. Are there any other questions that you thought we should address, Ashley, that before? Uh, there are some interesting ones, but we are just about out of time uh, with tonight's event. I did see some really interesting chats happening, though, where some questions were asked and then answered. Okay. Um, good. 
So, so that was great. Um, but of course, if anyone has questions, depending, Trisha, on what you want, perhaps they can email you or... Yeah. You can send any questions to my website, which is just my name, www.trishapritikin.com, and there's a place you can put in the question, and then I'll respond there and send you to wherever I can be helpful. That's one way to do it. <laughs> um, one quick question. Uh, are the chats going to be saved in the recording? That'd be good. Uh, I do. Yes, they are saved. Um, I'm happy to create a file of some kind with the chats in them, and I can send that out to anyone who's interested. Yeah. Uh, Tr Trisha, yeah. How, yeah. Do, how do people get involved? Uh, in, in Trying the, to do something about this. Oh, well, we have a nonprofit that we are... You know, it slowed down a little during the pandemic, but we do have a... A nonprofit that's trying to be the voice for people uh, like the Downwinders. Uh, that's Core Hanford. It's www.corehanford.org. And the latest thing we've done is is uh, create a document for with the National Park Service to tell them that we want to make sure that the Downwinder stories and the Hivakosha stories are included in the exhibits and the docent talks at the three sites of the Manhattan Project Historic National Park. That's just an example of what we're trying to do. I think after the pandemic, hopefully there will be, and after the pandemic, we can, we will be able to do more. But that's what we're doing right now. We'd love to have you, Bob. You know, any, any energy you want put into it. Okay. So thank you for participating. Thank you and everyone. And Tom and Bob. Thanks, yeah. Ashley, for everything. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, yeah, this was a fascinating conversation, Trisha and Tom and Bob and Karen. Um, so I really appreciate your insight and your willingness to share your time with us tonight. Um, our audience members, uh, please support Trisha and read more about the fight for atomic justice by buying her book um, here with us. You can find it by clicking the link that I put in the chat or on our website. Um, as always, your Support helps small bookstores like us stay open and bring authors to our community. So thanks again, everyone. Um, we hope to see you at more of soon, and I will send out the chat messages shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.